I'm going to stick closer to my manuscript today than I normally would because uh, this topic we're talking about today uh, it deserves very very close attention and care. We're going to be talking about evil and God's goodness and His grace and His efficiency in that. And when we tend to think of evil we know it when we see it. We don't have to subcategorize it, even though philosophers tend to subcategorize it. They talk about natural evil, and that's what we, we see in the world. Paul talks about the birth pangs of creation, and, and we see it all around us, even if people who are unchristian deny the existence of evil, and many of them do. But we should expect this, because Paul says that we suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And so we see an ontological change. That's a change in our nature. When sin entered the world, we died spiritual deaths. But God has revealed himself through creation as well. And so even if we suppress the truth and unrighteousness, when we see evil, we know it. Deep down, even if we want to call something that's not evil good, doesn't matter. God has written His laws on our hearts. That's general revelation. But we also see personal evil. If you have a doubt of that, just look at the 20th century. More people died in the 20th century than in the history of the entirety of the human race. Paul Pot, Cambodia, dictator, Adolf Hitler, the Jews, Mao Zedong, the communist dictator of China, 45 million deaths. Over 100 million died, at least, in the 20th century, probably closer to 150 million. And so we don't just see evil in creation, we see people committing evil acts towards each other. But Paul uses this interesting phrase, birth pangs. Mm. And, and it's, it's so fascinating to me that he uses this word because what are birth pangs? It's suffering. It's, it's not good. But it's suffering in anticipation of what? Something good. Something new. Something uh, a creation. Something, something that's life. Right? And so in, in Revelation 21... John says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. So remember, earth, creation is going through these birth pangs. But he says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the former things have passed away. Yet still, during this life, Paul states in Romans 8, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For, the e for they eagerly await the creation, waiting for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it. Notice this is part of God's plan. Because of Him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption and to freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth until now. And not only that, but we also ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for the adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our body, for in hope, for in that hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes in what he already sees? But if we hope in what we do not see, through perseverance we will eagerly wait for it. So God is one day going to make everything anew. 
That's his promise, yet still we face a world riddled with Satan, sin, and death. So my question for you is, as Christians, what do we do with that? This is what you call theodicy. So write that word down. This is an important word. Right? Theodicy. T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y. T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y. Here's where we get that word. It comes from the Greek word theos, which means God, and dikaiao, which means to justify. So it's a justification of God in light of evil. How do we justify God's goodness if evil exists in the world? We see so much injustice. We see the slaughter of the unborn. We see sickness. We see death all around us. We see people calling what is just, unjust, and what is unjust, just. Right? People flip what is good on its head. And then, and then we see natural evil in the world. We see pandemics. We see plagues, pestilence, floods. We see all these things. And so as Christians, how do we say we have a good God who is going to redeem all things and has already redeemed all things in Christ? But how could a good God allow for evil to exist? That is theodicy, a justification of the goodness of God in light of evil. And part of what I'm going to tell you today, which is just why this is hard for me, is my own testimony of God working through the suffering and sickness in my life to show himself good and his grace sufficient in all things. So today, what I want us to do is go to first, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to talk about the thorn in Paul's side. But here's what I want to encourage you to do today. I want you just to turn inward towards Scripture. I see so many people, so many Christians today, that they see the storehouse of Scripture. They have all this treasure within the house. And instead of looking at all that treasure, which its depths can never be plumbed, they just want to run to the window. They want, they want, they want something more. They want, they want extra revelation or extra whatever. And what, what is put in Scripture, which is called sufficient, is more than enough. More than we will ever need or be able to mine. And yet we're always running to the window, always looking for more. I need this direct revelation. I need this message. I need this word. I need this sign. And what did they do? They asked Jesus for a sign. And when he, he wouldn't give him one, his teaching wasn't enough. But we have an all-sufficient, God-breathed, inspired word right here that is perfect and errant and will never fail us. So why would we go anywhere else to try and answer this question? Philosophy is helpful in addressing this question, but if philosophy is not informed by our final authority scripture, we're ultimately going to falter. We're ultimately going to look in the wrong place. And so this, that's where we need to go. So let me encourage you first and foremost, if you're going to answer this question, and I think scripture provides us a sufficient answer, but it's not going to give us all the answers to this. We may never know God's purposes other than that he's going to use it for his glory and our good. And that should be enough. If that's enough for Paul, it should be enough for us. So, uh, let's go through 2 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 10. And I'm going to go slowly and exegete this for you. And so, Paul, Paul is dealing with all these issues in the Corinthian church. And there were, there were other teachers and they were boasting and things, right? And he says, boasting is necessary, but it is not beneficial. But I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I'm reading from the NASB because it's a literal translation, by the way. But I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a man was caught up into the third heaven. And so here's the interesting thing. He's actually talking about himself. So he shifts from the first person to the third person because he, he doesn't want to brag. And he even just says that boasting is not beneficial. He's talking about his own experience being caught up in this revelation that God had given him. And, and so he, he doesn't want to, want to brag. And, and the other thing is when he says caught up, this verb in Greek, it means it's passive. It's not something you do. It's something God did. He snatched him up. He took him. It's not something he could demand from God and say, take me up to the third heaven. Give me this vision. God decided to do it and reveal these things to him. And so Paul was passive in this, and he doesn't want to brag. And he gets ripped up in, in, into this, this third heaven, he calls it. And, and third is kind of superlative, so he might not mean that there's three levels of heaven or anything like that. He might just mean this is a, the greatest paradise I could see. It's a superlative. It's the greatest, right? Uh, but, but interestingly, he says he's not 
permitted to speak about it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one, one commentator describes it like this. Paul describes himself as being snatched, caught up into the her third heaven, into paradise. The verb suggests that Paul's experience was an involuntary one in which God took the initiative rather than one brought about by some preparation or special mystical technique. The experience was not something he sought or initiated and therefore was not something he could repeat whenever he wanted. And so this, 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 this third person and this warning against uh, bragging um, is also explained like this. Paul is reticent to speak about such, thing because, such, such things because he does not believe that recounting one's extraordinary mystical visions will do anything to build up the community. It only serves to build up the teller's ego and therefore is perilous. Why well, he warns against it. It certainly offers no proof of apostleship. History is littered with tales of frauds who have seduced and deluded followers by claiming to have some divine mission and some divine vision. Consequently, Paul rehearses this extraordinary episode in a way that stresses how useless it is to prove anything about him. True apostleship is established by the building up of community, not by how many ecstatic experiences one can claim. And that's why I warn people, we have everything we need in this word and what God has given us. We don't need to run to the windows and look away from scripture. We need to turn inward to it because there are things that are not permitted for us outside the building. That's why God has set the building up. Does that make sense? So uh, he goes on. And I know such a man, whether in body or apart from the body, I do not know God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words. It's, it's, it's amazing how many people get these revelations, and they're not inexpressible. They can tell you exactly what they are. But Paul says inexpressible. In behalf of such a man, I will boast. But in my own behalf, I will not boast, except what? Regarding my weaknesses. For I do wish to boast. If I do wish to boast, I will not be foolish, for I'll be speaking the truth, but I refrain from this, so that no one will credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. Because of the extraordinary greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exciting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. And so why does God give him this, right? To keep him from exalting himself and to point where? Inward? No. Up to God. Back to God. And here's, what, here, here's, here's the part of this that, that sunk its claws into my life when I was diagnosed with the disease I'm going to tell you about today. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might leave me. Yes. And he said to me, my grace yes. is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in what? Weakness. Weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I delight in weaknesses, insults, distresses, persecutions, difficulties in behalf of Christ. For when I am weak, when I am strong. Mm. And so to keep Paul humble, God gave him this thorn in the flesh. And why, why is it called a messenger of Satan? It's because it was hindering his ministry. Yet what would have hindered his ministry more? Boasting in his revelations, in his apostleship, and all these things. And, and so the first thing you need to realize about this is that it was given to God by I'm sorry, it was given to Paul by God. And so we recognize that the thorn is a bad thing, right? Suffering is not a good thing. Sickness, Satan, death, all those things are bad, right? Yet God is sovereign. Sovereignty means God's rule and his reign over all of creation, right? And so even, and this, is, this is the answer we come to with theodicy, that God is in control of all things and evil is still evil, but God is good, and so he uses evil for good. And, and, and the best uh, text 
that, um, that, that I know about is this interesting text in, in Genesis 50. So, so Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, right? Bad thing. Clearly a bad thing. He was in slavery for, I think, 19 years, and then God lifts him out, and he becomes second only to Pharaoh in the land. So he's the he's vice president of Egypt, essentially, right? And so um, the interesting thing is at this point, Joseph's brothers confront Joseph, or rather Joseph confronts his brothers, and they're scared he's going to what? Put him to death, right? And it's interesting if you read it in the Hebrew. The two sides of the passages are perfectly parallel. Joseph says, you intended it for evil. So they did it. They're responsible. They're culpable. What they did was wrong. It's still evil. But it also says, but God intended it for good in the saving of many lives. Mm -hmm. wow. and, and, and so we have this view called compatibilism. The existence of evil is compatible with God because of his goodness and sovereignty. And Paul says that he will use all things, what, for the good of those who love him and his mm -hmm. glory. So at the end of the day, there will be no one who can go to God and say, you were not just. You did not use these things. Everything. And sometimes it, it's, it's hard to get a perspective on that. So the other passage I love to point people to is in Acts, where it says, they went against your holy servant Jesus, Pontius Pilate, the Jews, and the Romans, everybody, right? and did what your hand and your plan predestined. So the worst thing that has ever happened, the crucifixion of the only holy man, the only good man, truly good, that has ever walked the earth, the slaughtering of the sinless Son of God, the worst thing that's ever happened, was also used by God for the greatest good that we could possibly imagine. And so if you can't see how all this crap in your life, all these evil things are being used by God, just yeah. zoom into the cross and let God's glory spread out from there. And so that, that's one of the things that really, really honed me in when, um, when I was diagnosed. And, and so he does the same thing in Paul's life, right? He gives him a thorn. It's, it's evil, but God uses it for Paul's good. And so before I give you my own testimony, let, let me say a few things. Um, God cares more about your holiness than your health. Okay? God cares more about your sanctification than your bank account. Okay? And what's sanctification? Becoming more and more Christ-like. God cares more about His glory than what you think you deserve and what you would define as prosperity. Because let me tell you something, the greatest thing that God can give you is Himself. And if He rips other things out of your life to draw you more and more into Him, there's no greater demonstration of love that He could show you. And so, let, another thing um, before I, I, t I tell my testimony, um, don't, don't ever let somebody tell you if God hasn't healed you or fixed you or fixed some problem that it's because you're not good enough or you're not holy enough or you don't have enough faith. Paul asked three times. Jesus asked three times in the garden. And God said, no. Right? No. Not, not your will, but my will be done. And I'm not saying God can't heal. I'm not saying God can't rip you out of whatever situation ultimately won't, and ultimately won't do that. But sometimes it's not His will. We don't get to tell God what He has to do, right? He's sovereign. He knows best. And He has already shown His love and the perfection of His salvation in Christ. And He will heal you. One day, one day you'll have a new body. You'll be raised up. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. But He hasn't purchased us that in this life. He's purchased it for the next life. And so we eagerly await because what? Hope's not hope if the things that are promised are already seen. Right? And again, that's not to say that God can't heal. I know a lady, um, uh, Ryan, your mom introduced me to her, um, who I think God did heal from MS. But it took 19 years for that promise to be answered. I think 19. Uh, two decades. And what if she died before that? What if God never heals me? Does that mean he's not good? 
or holy, or I'm lacking faith. Maybe I am lacking faith, but maybe he is using the multiple sclerosis and the suffering and the pain and all those things to draw me closer to him and build up my faith because he has not promised me uh, to see everything that he will give me today. And, and so let me close uh, with my testimony and how his grace has been shown more and more sufficient in my life in spite of my weakness. Actually perfected, as Paul says, in my weakness. Oh, one more thing. When he says, my, um, my grace is perfected in weakness, the word he uses there in the Greek is present, ongoing tense. So he's perfecting it. It's an ongoing thing, yeah. right? It's not today. It's an ongoing process of sanctification in your life. Uh, so seven years ago, the, uh, the doctor I saw, because I, I started getting numbness in my legs, thought I had cancer on my spinal cord. And at this point, I was engaged and uh, about to be married and about to start seminary and trying to move on with the rest of my life and excited. And then I thought maybe I have six months to live. And the place um, was up here. So if they removed it, I could have been paralyzed from my shoulders down. At that point, nobody in my family had multiple sclerosis. And that was at the bottom of the list. Uh, if you're a male, you're a lot less likely to have it. Um, and the further you are south, the less likely you are to have it. So I was a male from the deep south, and so multiple sclerosis is at the bottom of the list. Uh, cancer or a bruised spinal cord from, um, from the water sports I did was at the top of the list. But as time went on, they thought less and less that it was a bruise and more and more that it was cancer. So I had about a six month period in my life where I thought I was gonna die or be paralyzed. And uh, something like that will really, really pull you into God. Trust me. And so eventually, um, after spinal taps and MRIs and all sorts of horrible medical tests, the doctor told me, oh, you have multiple sclerosis. And I was like, multiple what? <laughs> I had no idea what it was. Um, and so um, I, I, I was not with a really good doctor. He didn't explain anything to me. And so I had to figure out what all this was for myself. And in case you are unfamiliar with multiple sclerosis, I'll go ahead and give you a quick rundown of it. Um, if you look at uh, some of these power cords right there, you'll see they have insulation around them, right? Your nerves and your brain and your spinal cord have the exact same thing. It has in an insulating layer that lets signals pass from your brain, your optic nerves, down your spine and reach the rest of your body. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, what happens is my immune system sees that insulation around the nerves and it strips the insulating layer from my nerves. And so if, if you imagine I just strip that insulating layer from that power cord over there, uh, the signal couldn't get through. Same thing with your nerves. And sometimes um, the nerves cannot just get stripped, but the immune system can transect or cut the nerves. And so it doesn't matter if your body tries to heal it, the nerves cut already. If I snip that power cord, it wouldn't matter if I put some tape on it, electricity is not getting through. Yeah. And so the doctor set about putting me on all these different immunomodulating and immunosuppressing drugs. And about a year into this, I started getting horrible pain. And so the doctors put me, um, I'll just give you a quick rundown of the medications they put, put me on. Oxycodone, oxycotton, hydrocodone, hydromorphone, um, uh, morphine, MS content, time release morphine. Um, and all that happened was my pain got worse and I could function less and less cognitively. And then I found myself, without warning from the doctors, mind you, dependent on narcotic pain medication. And at that point, they had tried 13 other non-narcotic drugs. So I had this pile of pill bottles. I'm trying to get a graduate degree in seminary. I can't function. The doctor has me on about 120 milligrams of OxyContin a day and tells me, we don't know what to do. And that, that's on top of all my other MS symptoms. So I get tremors in my hands. Um, I would get optic neuritis, my vision would start blurring. Mm. I wasn't able to, to urinate. Um, not, not things you want to deal with as a 25 year old newly wed, right? And all that time, I have people around me telling me the same thing. God should fix this. God's gonna do it. And then my Greek professor pointed that passage out to me and I really, really dug into it. Like, well, if he didn't take the thorn and Paul's side away and he didn't take Jesus from his wrath in the garden 
Why should I expect Him and demand of Him to heal me? Why can't I just be satisfied that He is enough? And so I found myself at a place of contentment, though my life was getting worse. And guess what? It didn't get better. It kept getting worse. And eventually, I did have about a year uh, where I got a little extra grace from God, and I got a spinal cord stimulator uh, before I started my last degree um, at Yale. And you can imagine trying to start a degree uh, at an Ivy League school and suffering um, on the equivalent of 220 milligrams of morphine a day. No, 250 milligrams, which is 120 milligrams of OxyContin, because it's 50% stronger than morphine. Um, and it was incredible. They did the spinal cord stimulator, and it numbed my spine in such a way that the pain didn't reach my brain. And so I was able to start off my last degree on a great foot. But then the pain started coming back. And it kept getting worse, and it kept getting worse. And I would go, this is where things got real bad. You think it's bad already? Uh, I would go uh, to the hospital, and I would think, well, this is one of the best hospitals in the country, it's Yale Teaching Hospital. And the doctors would, I would say, I'm prescribed this medicine, uh, please help me, I don't want to take more than I'm prescribed. And they would run all these tests, not help me with my pain because they were afraid uh, you get all these addicts coming in. And so they would charge me about $1,500 and I would leave the next day no better. Mm -hmm. Thinking, why didn't I just take the pain medicine? And uh, so eventually, I was just on more and more pain medicine and I would run out every month, a couple days early and they won't refill it early even if your pain is worse, even if uh, the doctor has created dependence. And so it got to the point where I would just order extra medication offline and it got me through the day but I, I couldn't couldn't function cognitively and it got to the point where where I would make my own medication at home and inject it into myself which is what they would do at the hospital and that just knocked my pain out saved about nine hundred and fifty dollars doing that <laughs> but not sustainable because you're giving yourself medication and you're injecting it and so, um, eventually, it got to be too much for me to handle. And um, it, it created all this devastation in my marriage. But, but, God delivered me to a really good doctor. And I got a pain pump, which is what I have now. And Ryan and Al and the other people who know me well can tell you what a struggle that's been because I didn't know this, but the doctor installed my pain pump incorrectly. And so I was actually getting 10% of the medication that I was supposed to get. And so I couldn't figure out, I, I have this implant, yet it's not helping. And I, the doctor kept ratcheting up the medicine, and he was like, you're on the equivalent in your pain pump of 300 milligrams of morphine a day. But really, I was getting about three milligrams equivalent. So uh, about the amount my three-year-old daughter could, could take over 24 hours. It was not doing a thing. And so it kept making things harder and harder with my marriage. And eventually, this doctor figured out that I'm at now, um, that my pain pump was in the wrong place. And um, in the past two months, since I've had my fourth surgery, I have been in almost no pain. And not just that, but God ripped me out of the situation I was in and then brought me to this church. Yes. That wouldn't have happened if, if not for all this crap. And in the midst of all that, he gave me a little baby daughter who's turning three today. But even though... Um, sorry, I'm trying not to choke up here. Uh, Take time. <laughs> yeah. Even though I have been through all this crap, God never abandoned me in any of it. And if not for my weakness and my sickness, I wouldn't have the relationship with God that I have today and the dependence I have upon Him. So even though all this crap happened, God was still 
good enough in my weakness. And I don't know if he will ever heal me in this life of MS, but I have a new body waiting on me in the new heaven and new earth. And so God might bring you lower than you ever thought you could be, but it's just to raise him higher than you ever thought he could be. I'm not sure how to close after that. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Would you please pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you place yourself higher and mightier than anything we might place for ourselves in our own life. That you raise yourself up, even through evil, God. And what a testament that is to your goodness. And we thank you that you have guaranteed ultimate justice through the cross and your new creation. We love you, Lord. And I pray if anyone today doesn't know you, that they would come. Uh, to myself or any of the other ministers and, and that we might share the gospel and, the, and, and your glory and your goodness with them that they might they might they might know you today Lord uh, we are not promised another day uh, but we are promised eternity with you um, and we thank you for that Lord we love you and I thank you for what you're doing in every person's life here today and those watching with us online um, I thank you for giving me the courage to, to speak about this, that you might be lifted up and that I might not boast in anything in myself. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. It's in your name.